Hello, dental online trainers, and welcome to the Dental Online Training Sharecast. I'm your host, Dr. Dennis Hartley. Each month, we'll talk with dental experts who are doing amazing work in the world of dentistry. Also, occasionally, I'm going to throw in a few of my solo bonding sharecasts where I share a little with you about what I've learned along the way during my career. So tune in the first Tuesday of every month to hear the latest episodes. Hello, Dental Online Trainers, Dr. Dennis Hartley back with you again for another ShareCast episode. Today's guest is Dr. Rebecca Bacow, orthodontist slash periodontist and educator extraordinaire. And she's out of Seattle, Washington. I say educator extraordinaire because I've seen Rebecca countless times. I don't even know how many times. It's been over a half dozen at least. If you're not familiar with Rebecca, she's one of the most impactful speakers in dentistry today. Rebecca is a graduate of the University of Washington School of Dentistry. And thank you, by the way, because you guys kicked Michigan State's uh, the Spartans butt this uh, this couple weekends ago. And I'm a Michigan fan. So thank you for that, those Huskies. Um, and she completed a dual specialty uh, program at University of Penn, orthodontics and periodontics. Uh, Rebecca is a resident faculty member at Spear Education, along with people like Jeff Rouse that you've heard on the podcast and Greg Kinzer and Jim McKee. Uh, she's authored numerous journal articles uh, like Audrey Yoon and, um, and others. Um, she's a coveted speaker for dental meetings everywhere where her focus is on collaborative treatment planning and dentistry, and especially for like the airway compromised child and adult. Uh, she's been interviewed a zillion times on a bunch of podcasts talking about the science and the art of expansion and facial growth um, on other podcasts. Uh, people like the Dental Guys podcast and Alan Mead from Dental Hacks and Melissa Sieberts, they do a great job of geeking it out and getting into the technical stuff. We're, we're not going to do that today. Because what I want to talk about is the stuff outside and sort of leading into how she does the dentistry that she does, how she became the orthodontist and the educator that she is. And it turns out she's actually more than that. She's actually a human being. She's a mom, she's a wife, and she's a business owner. She practices dentistry. And what we want to talk about is how do we make that imbalance work? How do we put that all together? How do you put all those pieces together in that puzzle and still have some semblance of, you know, sanity in this uh, crazy profession that we have? So dental online trainers, uh, kick back and relax and listen to our episode with my conversation with Dr. Rebecca Bacow. So Rebecca, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. Yeah, just a little bit of a different take on, on how, when we were talking before we got on here, one of the challenges that I had when I was a young dentist was I didn't, I couldn't see myself achieving high level dentistry when I was a young dentist. I thought that was for like other people. And I didn't think that I would have the gifts. I, I didn't, I wasn't naturally gifted. I'm not, certainly not the smartest guy in the room for sure. And I was always intimidated um, when I would see these speakers, but I wanted to be doing the type of dentistry they were doing. So the first, first question I have for you actually is, um, you graduated from University of Washington School of Dentistry and you practiced general dentistry for a couple of years. And then you started geeking it out and just learning dentistry. So tell me about those, those couple of years after you graduated from University of Washington Dental School. Well, so my journey actually started before that, if I could give you a snapshot of Love my it. dental school time. Perfect. At University of Washington, where I was in the pre-doc program, my clinical chair was right next to grad pros. And it was like a short wall that divided us. You could see over the wall. and I kept kind of looking, oh, what are they doing over there? And I'm just getting really interested in what's happening beyond single tooth dentistry. I had some phenomenal mentors, uh, practicing prosthodontists that would rotate through the clinical floor and uh, graduates from the Panky Dawson program, people that sort of started to push the envelope. And I, I happened to know Dr. Michael Cohen in my senior year of dental school. Well, well, actually even before that, so there, there were grad seminars in perio and pros and ortho. And because of the University of Washington legacy, there was a lot of interdisciplinary seminars. Mm-hmm. And so 
Frank, Vince, Dave Matthews would come and do a combined seminar in, and um, they had interdisciplinary seminars where all the grad students would come together. And with, with permission, I joke that I snuck in, but I was given permission. I would sit in the back of the room in these grad seminars and Dennis, my mind was blown. And I just thought, oh my God, there is something beyond just single tube dentistry. I didn't have an appreciation for um, periodontics and, and just all the planning that went into a single tooth implant placement and, and how, how much detail went into the restorations and, and why do we need a full contour wax up with set of mounted models and just all the diagnostic information that comes from a wax up and the process. And I thought this is just incredible. So then I was talking to Dr. Michael Cohen and he said, Becca, and this was probably 2007, 2008. He said, if you can get yourself to Seattle Symposium, um, if you can pay for your flight and your hotel, I, I will let you come to the meeting as my guest. Wow. And I flew from Seattle to Naples, Florida. I, I, had, I had no, it was, it was a big stretch for me, the, the plane ticket and the hotel room. I right. shared a room with a vendor mm -hmm. and um, and. I sat front row in that meeting. I, I think I didn't even want to go to the bathroom right. because I didn't want to miss a second. And he took this textbook, The Art of the Smile, and he brought it to life. And every chapter is a different phenomenal author. Um, Yaki Gambrina and Ricardo Matrani, a lot of UW people. Um, sure. and, and, and I got to see the Salama brothers. And of course, John Coyce, Frank Spear, Vince Kokich. And, and I was blown away. And then also just, as you know, when you go to these meetings, you get to know all the participants and all the conversations that happen over lunch or coffee or, um, or at the pool or at the bar late at night. Right. And I just thought, oh my gosh, there is so much more than single tooth dentistry. So I bought the book at the conference. I think I read it cover to cover on the flight from Florida to Seattle. And I just thought this, this is what I want to do. So at the end of my senior year, I started the process to apply for grad pros. And at UW, um, it's so you take a mock board exam. So I studied for it and you have to prep teeth and you have to do a full contour wax up. And, mm. and I thought, this is what I want to do. Yep. And, and thank you, Michael Cohen. He called me, he said, Beth, I think you should go practice. You don't know what you want to do yet. Go practice. And so he introduced me to Dr. Glenn Krieger, who is a phenomenal restorative dentist, and he also loved to teach, and he was looking for an associate. So I joined his practice, and he was so committed to CE. So I was pro probably like, like many of the listeners, we're all CE junkies, um, those that are taking the time to listen to this, and, and I was going to multiple study clubs a week. Yep. occlusion study clubs, TMJ study clubs, sleep study clubs, interdisciplinary study clubs, and driving, you know, sometimes an hour or more to get to a club. Yep. And I thought, I, I have to learn more. I have to go back to school. And I started thinking as I was practicing that a lot of the issues I was seeing as a restorative dentist were because the foundation itself was breaking down. Mm -hmm. The bone and the teeth were in the wrong place. And I thought, if I can set the foundation mm. and I can work with a phenomenal or, or multiple phenomenal restorative dentists and they can put it all back together. Wow. And I had wonderful mentors like Dr. Ward Smalley, oh. who's perioprost ortho. And I used to, and, and, and of, of course the late Vince Kokich, anytime I could hear these phenomenal speakers, I would be there. I would find ways to get into these right. meetings that I probably wasn't supposed to be in. And, and I would just sit and listen and soak it all up. And if I could hear the same talk given three, four times, I just, I just loved it. And um, so I heard that there was a combined program at Penn that was perio and ortho at the same time. Right. And it was like, if I could do that, that I mean, that's the dream. So um, I applied, thank goodness they accepted me. And, and then I was off to Philadelphia. And, and UPenn has a really, really strong interdisciplinary legacy. Sure they have a combined perioprosthesis mm -hmm. um, uh, program and, and then, of course, perio-ortho. And, and so it, it, 
my background from UW was very interdisciplinary in nature and then to be thrown in at Penn. And, and a lot of the philosophies are very similar. Uh, just there's a lot of people that are educators today that have been through both of those programs or had influence from both of those schools. So it's really, it was really special to, to kind of having practiced be able to see where some of the origins of some of these influences are. Yeah. Uh, you know, I want to unwrap a couple of things because you've said so many things that are so critical. Uh, one of the first things, uh, first of all, Michael Cohen is the head of Seattle Study Club. He started that decades ago and a huge influencer in dentistry from the Seattle area, obviously. And so their symposium, their annual symposium is just an incredible meeting, three or four day workshop um, lectures, some workshops, smaller presentations. Uh, but he's just been one of the greatest influencers in dentistry. And then you mentioned Frank Spear and Dave Matthews and uh, Vince Kokich, not Dave Matthews of the band. Uh, Dave Matthews, the periodontist who was incredible and worked with Frank and, and Vince for, for so many years. But one of the things that you said that I think is so important is that you said you were offered to go down and take the course for free, which is really just wonderful. Of, of my Cohen to do that for you, but you had to be able to cover your flight and, and your own, your room. And you said you made it work and it wasn't easy. And this is what I want the young listeners to listen to, because, you know, when you're starting out, it is about scraping, scraping those few dollars, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. I remember the first time I went to Spear, and this is when Frank was in his old office, it took me a year to pay that off my credit card. It took me a full year to pay off that one course. But it was so pivotal in my education, in my learning, in my way of thinking. Um, I remember listening to John Cranham talk about the first time we went to Dawson, he slept in this car. He would go poolside to be able to wash off in the morning because he couldn't afford a hotel room. And his food was just eating at the, you know, the little banquets that they would set up in the, in the morning, um, the buffet for, for breakfast and stuff. And he'd grab his lunch and he'd hoard food. Because that's what you got to do. You know, if you don't have the finances, you scrape and claw and you make it work and you, you don't complain, you just do it because that yeah, information yeah. is so valuable, right? For sure. For yeah. sure. You know, and the, the, I, I think the other thing that, that you talked about was a huge issue that I had when I was graduating from dental school at Michigan. I couldn't put the pieces together. I saw restorative dentistry separate from perio, separate from ortho, separate from endo, and I could not connect the pieces. And that was one of the frustrating things for me. Um, and I looked at going into Pross, but I was still like sort of not sure. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I think that's one of the challenges of dental school education is helping connect the dots, creating these links between the specialties and the programs. And maybe it's just too short of a time, and maybe I was just too dense of a student to be able to do it. But I think that what you talked about, seeing those pieces interlinked and, uh, and, and having that opportunity, what, what, a great, what a great kickboard for you in your, in your learning and stuff. How, how, and you took advantage of it. That's the thing. You took advantage of it. So, you know, it's, not, it's one thing to see it there. It's the other thing to say, I'm going to be brave enough to ask if I can go through that. So kudos to you, Rebecca. That's awesome. Thanks. It's exciting times and it's difficult as a dental student, right? I mean, I don't know for you, but I was certainly challenged by all the things we had to learn in dentistry. I don't know what, what it felt like to you when you were in dental school. Yeah, I mean, we're just trying to get through our requirements and trying to, it was hard to find patients. I don't know how it is in other parts of the country, but you had to do so many endo teeth, have so many crown preps and people maybe couldn't afford it or you didn't have the patient pool and just trying to, trying get to get through. through. How, how uh, do you, so I'm always super curious and I think it's just wonderful hearing stories on how dentists became dentists. So what is, what was your influence? How did you end up getting into dentistry? Um, everyone in my family's in medicine. I thought for sure that's what I wanted to do. And I was in college and all through high school, all through college, I took a lot of uh, extra extra courses um, through different universities in metals, metal work. Okay. So a lot of jewelry making and metal sculpture. And um, I really enjoyed it. And, and someone, one of my teachers said, you know, a lot of this, these instruments are donated by dentists, huh. all the cast metal framework and um, people that would retire and had all this you know, UW, we have, we have Tucker in our backyard. So a lot right. of cast gold. 
And so I, I, I remember I told my dad, hey, dad, I think I'm going to apply to dental school. And he, he said, well, you're going to do what? Why not medicine? I said, I, you know, I really like working with my hands. I think I'd really enjoy it. So he said, why don't you go shadow some people, make sure you like it. And I did. And I loved it. And I applied and I was sort of the black sheep in the family. But I think now they understand how much I love it. So everybody's okay with it. But for a while, they, they just couldn't quite figure out why did I choose that? When you go into dentistry, there's uh, different responsibilities than when you go into medicine, right? You go into dentistry, well, maybe not so much anymore, but certainly when you graduated and then certainly when I did, you're, you're looking at owning your own practice and being a business owner, being a leader. Uh, was, was that interesting to you? Did you look at that also and say this would be fun? Yeah, well, and, and my father had his own medical practice. Uh, what what I, what kind of pushed him out was was there was just the there that didn't exist anymore by right. the time he retired. Mm -hmm. But but I always had that as part of my vision was to run my own office. So, how much how much are you lecturing these days? This year maybe too much, um, but uh, I try try to limit it to once a month. That doesn't always happen. So it's interesting. I, uh, my previous partner in practice was uh, Dr. Buddy Mopper, who was sort of like the original Dr. Bond. He started bonding teeth back in the 70s. And it was one of, uh, with Erwin Schmeigel and Ronnie Goldstein, one of the really, one of the pioneers in cosmetic dentistry and uh, direct resin bonding. And Buddy would tell stories about when he was doing things, it was really very pioneering. And he would get a lot of pushback from the, uh, the techniques that he was doing. And I would hear Dawson talk about this and Dawson would talk about when he would get on stage. I mean, people would really just, I mean, it, it could turn into fights over the materials that he was presenting. Now, when you start talking about expansion with adults and you start talking about techniques, uh, you know, SARPI and we're going to we'll geek it out and dome procedures and things like that. When you're out, when you're on, on the podium, do you feel like you're you're pushing the envelope that you're talking things that maybe people are not familiar with and trying to move the profession forward a little bit? Do you feel that? I think there is still pushback in the ortho world in, in certain pockets, depending on what their experiences have been and depending on what papers they've read. I think there's a greater interest in the orthodontic community to learn more about the interplay between airway and sleep and where we position the jaws and the teeth. So I, I think the pendulum is swinging, but I think it's, it has, it, it's not as mainstream yet, but I think we're getting there. Yeah, I certainly hope so. I, I don't think in my community it's mainstream yet. I think there's a little pushback still in the Chicago area. It, it blows me away when I talk to an orthodontist and they're not familiar with Rebecca Baukow. They're not familiar with the work of, of the Stanford group and the things that are being done and the results from expansion. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's challenging for a restorative dentist when we're trying to have a conversation with our patients but then we don't get the orthodontic support. You know, the orthodontist will essentially say, well, you know, we, we, we don't really have the evidence to support that. How do you, how, how do you, how do you respond to that? Um, it's frustrating because the evidence is there. It just depends on how hard you want to look for it. The, the cool thing for better or for worse, a lot of these papers are coming out right now. Uh, some of these publications that, that even I cite in my teaching are 2021, 2022 this is happening right now. And so we have to stay current. Not all of the papers are being published in the traditional ortho journals. The, the paper that you, that you referenced there briefly, the one that, that I was able to collaborate with Dr. Audrey Yoon, that was 2022, the journal Sleep Medicine. If you want to talk impact factor, uh, right. sleep medicine is a, is a much higher impact factor than like AJODO. Right. So, so the evidence is there. It's just, do, do, do we want to look for it? Um, I think also maybe historically, a lot of people are looking at the wrong markers. So for example, the AAO published a white paper and they definitively said that 
there is not enough evidence that expansion can cure sleep apnea. Okay. That's true. Yep. But but why is that our endpoint? Right. Maybe maybe our endpoint is creating a healthier periodontium or widening the nasal floor or improving sleep and breathing or um, reducing airway resistance or looking at things like rhinometry. So there's there's other markers that we can use that are also important, quality of life, um, shrinkage of adenoids and tonsils. There's, there's other things um, beyond just how did teeth fit together on a set of study models or, um, or, or, or did we cure apnea, which there's so much to unpack there, just, just let, let alone a sleep study and, and how we measure sleep apnea in children is, we could say that's flawed to begin with. For sure. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a study designed for adults, adult males, we could right. maybe even argue, I mean, we could no doubt really about get that. into the weeds here. Um, no doubt in, about in it. In terms of how, you know, but, but is, is that really our marker? And so if that's our marker and you hang your hat on that white paper, then, then you can sit up tall and kind of poo-poo everything. Um, similarly, a lot of the studies that talk about is phase one treatment effective, the end point that those studies, a lot of them, was how well do study models fit together? Right. But if we're thinking about the face, if we're thinking about lip dynamics and tongue up and nasal breathing and sleep quality and facial growth, there's, there's a lot more than do the teeth fit together. And because do you, think you can take out teeth and get the teeth to fit together. Not that taking out teeth is bad, but maybe, maybe we can look at different endpoints. And, and so I think it's, we have to keep pushing our, our own thought process in this journey. And, and what we know today is going to be different than what we know in three years, because things are evolving so quickly. Do, do you think... And, and not to, I, I mean, I have great orthodontists I work with, so I don't want to say that orthodontics as a whole, but it feels to me in my 30 some years of practicing that of all the professions that are slowest to accept change um, is, is orthodontics. And, I, and it surprises me because they, they are certainly the smartest people in our class, right? There's always the, the top people in our class. Uh, and they get to do such wonderful things and they, they, they have such great opportunities, but they always, to me over the years, have been the ones that have been most resistant to new information and change. Now, may, maybe that's just my perspective of someone who's a restorative dentist, uh, but I, I wonder, do you see that culturally in orthodontics or is that just my one person's perspective? Well, I think similar to, so, uh, maybe I'll, I'll think about this a little differently. So this podcast is phenomenal because it's geared towards a, a, a younger generation in, of dentists that maybe we think about all that we have to cram into four years of dental school. Yep. And so that from materials to histology to, you know, techniques with crown preparation and bonding. And, and now we throw in the whole digital side of things. Yep. Um, it's, it's hard to also incorporate things at advanced levels like interdisciplinary care. And so we can think of dental school as a starting point yeah. mm -hmm. for our career of lifelong learning, joints and mounting model, like all, right. a lot of that we can't, we can't get through because of, we have, we have so much other material to cover in dental school. For so sure. similarly in residency, if a residency program is two to three years, depending on where you go, right. by the time you learn about records and how to move teeth and just the basics of growth and development uh, it's it's hard to teach it all Fair and, enough. and i think in orthodontics my peers are super excited about new technology there's a lot of really exciting things coming in orthodontics with regards to digital treatment planning mm -hmm. and um Every, everything there's some there's some very cool stuff happening with with CAD CAM technology so there's a lot of innovation happening there's a lot of growth there's a lot of exciting things and and I think people are changing and changing their practices but I, I do think there's interest in airway I think you might not see it as much 
Well, I think that's a really good point. I say when I was in dental school, I had to learn one inch of, a, of material a mile deep. Today, students have to learn a mile of material an inch deep. And it's, uh, I think it's way more difficult. And so I can certainly see that in a residency program also, especially in orthodontics where there are so many changes and trying to learn about facial dynamics, right? And the, and the opportunities that, that, that are available. I mean, I think it's super exciting. One, one of the challenges, and, and I don't know f- from your end, because as an orthodontist who treats patients that need expansion, and so I'm thinking both as pediatric and for adults, um, mm-hmm. when I have a patient who has, you know, suspected airway issues, and so we're trying to, you know, we'll, we'll go through and we'll, we'll do a sleep study or, and we'll, we'll look at that if, if they, you know, we see a lot of women though, who will pl- pass a sleep study, right? They're, right. They, right? They, they don't have sleep apnea, but they, you know, they have some sort of upper airway resistance. Um, and then trying to communicate how moving the teeth, moving, expanding the jaw, how that's going to improve their quality of life. That for me is still a sticky point. It's still maybe because I I can't hang my hat. Like if I, I can say, look, if I do this composite, this tooth is going to look better, right? I I can guarantee it. It's going to look better if I do this, but that's always been a, this is a challenge for me right now, much like it was when I started doing TMJ stuff 30 years ago right? When I started doing splint therapy, I didn't have all those years of experience that I could feel confident with it. Do you, do you run into that? Or do you, have you seen enough of it that you just know that this is likely going to be really, really helpful and beneficial for the person? Yes, I've done enough that I'm confident it's going to be helpful. And I think we have the literature to support that now. And I'm happy to share those papers. A lot of this work, like you alluded to earlier, has come out of Stanford we've shown, for example, um, a paper came out, I think last year, that said that dome improves nasal breathing definitively in patients that had failed septoplasty. So you have these patients that they can't breathe well through their nose. They've tried other surgical interventions. You can only assume they've tried non-surgical before that. And the tried and true methods of ENT surgery have failed them. And now we have this method where we can actually widen the nasal floor. Which which widens, it's widening the maxilla, which widens that nasal floor. It opens up the internal nasal valve. It creates more tongue space. Now we get tongue out of the pharyngeal airway space. So so the, the repercussions from a health and wellness perspective continue on. They're magnified just by doing this simple procedure. So we could look at it and put it in a box and say, well, that's an ENT or an orthognathic procedure, but, but now you involve the orthodontist. It's, it's not a foreign treatment plan. It's, it's, we've been doing SARPI for a long time, but now all of a sudden we, we start tying in airway. I'm an orthodontist. I practice clinical orthodontics, but, but asking new questions makes it pretty interesting, pretty exciting. I have patients that come back after TAD expansion crying crying in the chair saying, I can dream. Ah. I haven't dreamed. Or, or, hey, I was dating this guy and I just, I warned him ahead of time, I'm a terrible sleeper. And now I sleep through the night. This was yesterday, this was this week. These are comments I heard. It's life-changing. Right. These people, and, and you think about these little kids. I saw a family this week and I got a high five from a little girl and, and a hug from the mom. She says, my kid isn't waking up anymore. So it's, it's not just that child, it's that child and, and his or her cognitive development. And then it's, it's the repercussions of the whole family not being woken up, not struggling with this child's misbehavior at the end of the day. It's much more exciting. For, for people who haven't taken the dive into sleep dentistry and sleep medicine, there's a world out there that you have to explore. The poor quality sleep, especially, I mean, for children, it really affects developmental issues, their ability to learn, their ability to do um, tasks and, and, and basic things. Um, ADD, ADHD has been strongly associated with, with airway issues, compromised airway issues, and then going into adults. And I've heard so many anecdotal stories um, from other clinicians who've treated patients with some sort of expansion like the SARPI, which is a palatal expander surgically placed with TADS. Uh, 
and they can start breathing and, and they have the same thing that it's almost like in, they, when it, when it expands, when that expansion hits, I hear they automatically, they start breathing better. Is that what you, is that what you have found also? Yep. Yep. They, they can so, feel it. And then to say, it's like immediate. I have to share another story with you just because you're asking about origins. So there's yeah. a big piece that I haven't shared yet. Now that we're talking about airway and that's, so when I finished my program, 2013, I came back to Seattle and one of my mentors, a periodontist, uh, Bob, Dr. Bob Gottlieb. I know said, Bob very well. Um, I love Bob. Um, and he said, Becca, Jeff Rouse is coming to Seattle and he's doing a three-day course in Seattle. And I think you should come. And I had just graduated. I had tons of debt. I wasn't working yet. I can happy to share my startup story with you, but I would love to hear that too. But um, I really wanted to go. All of my good friends um, were, were going to be there. And so I emailed him and I said, I really want to go, um, but I don't, but I can't pay for it. And, um, and he let him I'm so generous. He said, if you can cover the cost of, of what your overhead costs to be at the meeting, please come which included, you know, whatever the meals were going to be, the cost of the hotel room um, and uh, the printed, the printed manual. And I sat for three days in the front row and I just, I, I once again, didn't even want to go to the bathroom because right. I didn't want to miss a second. And I just sat there for three days and I thought, oh my God, these are all orthodontic patients. Oh, interesting. These, these are airway patients. These are adults and children with sleep apnea, but these are all orthodontic patients. You could see that by looking at the clinical cases. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And it was this aha moment for me. Wow. And, um, you know, people that have taken Jeff's courses, they joke. It's like that scene in the matrix. You take this pill and your life will never be the same again. That's me. I took Jeff's course and uh, yeah, I went into the deep dive. You, you can't not see it once you see it. And I thought, yeah. oh my God. And my program um, at Penn was really unique because my mentor, Dr. Robert Van Arsdale, oh. he used Slick. to take Slick. I love that you know him. He was such a special person to yeah. me. So he expanded everybody. You walk in his clinic, five, six years old, you got a top expander, bottom expander, and it was double. It was top and bottom. So U Penn and U Michigan were sort of the two pockets in the country that did upper and lower expansion. I don't know why that's so controversial, but it makes sense to me because you're, you're growing and developing the jaws together. And Dr. Van Arsdale, his rationale was to prevent gum recession. He was a periodontist. And he said, if we can get the bone in the right place and then get the teeth to be centered in the bone, we're not going to see as much recession, similar to Dr. McNamara. But yep. if you look at their studies and you look at their cases, not only was the periodontium healthy, they tended to have less extractions. They tended to have less impacted canines. They tended to be more stable and they didn't know it, but the airway was better. Right. And so we were doing TAD expanders in my resident. I mean, it was like a, a joke in a good way. Like any teenager that came in got a TAD expander. We, it was so commonplace in our training. And so then to sit in 2013 and hear Jeff, and I remember showing you my cases after I said, we're, we're doing this. We're doing this predictably. And he pointed me to literature that was published in thoracic journals and ENT right. journals. And, and it was, it, it was the most incredible, most eye-opening experience for me to, to all of a sudden to kind of, like you, like you mentioned, you start connecting these dots and, and the world just got a lot bigger and a lot more exciting. That's so cool. It's so funny. Um, you know, I was, I was going to ask you about influences and obviously Jeff Rouse, uh, as we just spoke about, was such a huge influence. And it's interesting, the orthodontist I used to work with, um, he trained at Penn and that's how I got to know Slick Ben Arsdale. Oh. And who, um, who is that? Uh, John Ford, he practiced in uh, in Winneka where, where I was practicing okay. and we worked side by side. Uh, my suite was next to his and he was a huge proponent of, of expansion and it made room for the teeth. Uh, 
and again, but that was mostly with kids, right? With this is before we really weren't doing any adults and any adults we were doing were, you know, sort of techniques from the eighties and nineties and certainly not, not progressive, like what's, what's happening today, mm -hmm. but it made it so much easier. And I, I only see adults and I work on kids for uh, aesthetic treatment, but when there's room for the missing lateral, when the teeth are in the right position, when, when, yeah, it, it, it just, you know, and, and so John was a, was a big fan of slick and introduced me to all these, these concepts of making sure the maxilla was in the right spot and putting the mandible in the right spot. So yeah, that's really neat to hear. One thing I want to ask you about because, well, actually I want to bring a point. So we were at a, a meeting this summer and there was an orthodontist that was presenting and, uh, there was a, it was a four bicuspidic um, uh, removal case that to a non-orthodontist, it was screaming, please expand me. And I don't know if you remember this. And I just, I was thinking to myself, I wonder if her, if her skin is just like, if she's just crawling right now, because do you, do you go into, do you see in these meetings where these cases that would just be so, so would be so helped by just traditional expansion or what you're doing expansion and that's not being done do you just want to scream do you know do you know the the uh, presentation that I'm speaking of I'm not sure I remember that particular one but I think when I see cases probably like you we all start treatment planning in our head and right. we look at an initial case and we all start thinking okay here's how I would treat that patient and we go and and these clinical decisions are based on experience and literature and, and what we've learned through our careers. And we have in our head how what the direction we're going to go. And and you it probably happens to you as well. You go to a meeting and you see a case and you think, I would have done it differently. Mm -hmm. And that I guess that's what makes our that's what makes it fun and exciting. Right. And um to never disparage someone or never think it's, it's never a right or a wrong way. It's just a different way. And, and with my background and my training, I would maybe treat it differently, but that's when, okay. You know, I, it brings me back when Dr. Mopper, he was presented at the aesthetic meeting years ago and his presentation was on diastema closure. <laughs> he was on the, in the dais and he looked out over the audience and this is all the sort of who's who are out in the audience. And he says, all you that are out there preparing teeth for porcelain veneers to close diasmas, you should be thrown in jail <laughs> because you could do it a lot more. Um, you could do it without tooth removal by just doing direct resin bonding. And so maybe that's an extreme, but my, my thought is, is that when I'm still seeing cases that are presented that don't offer the option of expansion, that aren't even considering it and just looking still at sort of, you know, historic, historic ways of treating, treating jaws and teeth. It, it, it's frustrating from someone who's not even an orthodontist to see that. And I have to imagine that that's can be a little bit frustrating for you with with what you've learned, and the patients that you've treated and how you've been successful, improving quality of life, not just getting teeth in the right spot. We, we, we hope we try. That's our mission for sure. So the, the more this information is disseminated, I think, I think it's happening. Mm -hmm. I think it's happening. And I think people like Jeff Rouse getting the message out, um, wonderful restorative dentists like yourself that are pushing their communities. Now you have maybe two or three orthodontists in your community that maybe think, gosh, maybe I should learn more. And then trying to find high quality opportunities for education that also isn't, um, isn't prevalent. And so where, where does one learn or where does an interdisciplinary team learn? And I think that's, that's another thing we're trying to, trying to help with. And I think Spears doing a, a phenomenal job of bringing all those pieces together. I, you know, For between sure. having McKee there to talk about joints and, and Rouse with the airway and the stuff that you're doing. And of course with Kinzer and Janikowski and everyone who's there, you know, and that, that does bring me, I wanted to ask you about the relationship of joints with the, the the patients that you're seeing and so drew obvious um if you haven't seen drew mcdonald he's he's a, an educator that's coming up that you're going to um, hear a lot about and drew's an orthodontist who's really spent a lot of time looking at joint related to especially class two patients but just uh, in general how what, what are your thoughts and uh, you know mckee and rouse did a presentation at the restorative academy several years ago which you know sort of like the chicken and the egg airway versus with the joint. 
And so what are your thoughts when you're evaluating patients on the joints, joint position, joint health and stuff as you're looking at these airway patients? Yeah, great question. And this is kind of, it's a hot topic for me. I'm very interested in growth and development. That's probably my, one of my big passions is how, and how, what are the things that influence jaw growth? And I think if you talk to Piper or, or anyone trained by Piper, though, the first thing they'll say is injury. All class twos are secondary and injury. Right. And I, I want to add, yes, I, I think that there's truth to that, that, that a, an injury to the joint, especially during a formative growth time, especially if it damages the disc, of course, we're going to see aberrant growth. Yep. Now, um, Dennis, I have more questions than I have answers. So I'll share yep. with some of my questions when it comes to mandibular growth. I think we haven't done a very good job of acknowledging early habits and early compensations secondary to airway. Hmm. For example, simple example, let's look at adenoids and tonsils. If you have a kid who's mouth breathing, what's that going to do to the lower jaw? Yep. So now you have this lower jaw that's constantly open. You have a condyle that's displaced in the fossa. Maybe, maybe that's going to influence growth, downward, backward growth. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe we have uh, displacement of the disc off of the condylar head, secondary to some sort of downward, backward placement position mm -hmm. in the lower jaw. Mm -hmm. Or, and, or, I should say, and, or, we have these kids and the lower jaw, let's say, is not growing as far forward. Now, when the top teeth erupt around age seven, they erupt forward, we start to establish a lower lip entrapment. Right. And we see these kids, I see them every day in my practice, and they sit there and when they swallow, when they rest, their upper their upper teeth are pushed up against their lower lip. So maybe the way we define injury, I'm let's that's that's an injury every time they swallow, every time they rest when they're sleeping. Yep. So so we have displacement of the condylar head in the fossa. We might have the disc up and over. So we're gonna have lack of growth. Um, or we have a deep bite. Talk about a deep bite, same thing. Every time they swallow, every time they chew, every time they go into a chewing cycle, they hit their front teeth and they have to come back. Um, what about thumb sucking? Exactly. We have the thumb resting on the lower jaw during formative growth periods. One, two, three years old, that's when this is happening. Yep. Tongue tie. Tongue is pulling that lower jaw down and back. The tongue inserts in the mandible. So if we have some sort of myofascial tightness leading to oral comp and, and, and functional compensation patterns, that's going to negatively impact growth. And so I don't know that we have all the answers, but I think in the orthodontic community and the dental community, we have an opportunity to ask new questions and to get very curious in a way that we've, and, and I think going back to our earlier conversation, I don't think we've done it justice yep. in dentistry, whether we blame the orthodontic camp or, or dentistry as a whole. Yeah. Let's look at some of these early compensations. One, two, three years old. What are bottles doing to these kids? No kidding. What are pacifiers doing to these kids? And then, you know, if it goes beyond a certain age, 12, 18 months, we're looking at little, little ones. Yep. What impact does breastfeeding have on facial growth and development? And, and so if we're, if, if we start asking our questions at age 12, we've missed a lot of information. No doubt. So to circle back to the question about the joints, I, I think I have more I have more questions and I have answers. Well, you and me both. You know, it's funny you brought up tongue tie because that's like a whole new arena for me. And, and again, I, I treat mostly adults, but I treat, treat adults with, uh, with airway issues. And I'm now, I used to look at the tongue, but now I'm tr really looking at the tongue, looking at tongue tie mm -hmm. and understanding more about the position of, or the shape of the maxilla and the position of the mandible related to to tongues. And so okay. it's just getting more and more complicated. Then, you know, I, I, I say, you know, it was a lot easier being a physician 150 years ago when all your only treatment was leeches and like surgical removal, right? There was like two things you could do, but it's getting more and more complicated to practice in a non-single tooth dentistry world. 
right? When you want to do complete dentistry, as uh, Paul Homily would say, or com you know, comprehensive dentistry, it's got to be collaborative, but there's still so much to learn. And I'm getting so old and I can't keep up. It's like the, the, in the information's got to slow down because I can't keep up with everything that's coming out. How do we do this? I think, I think you're doing a huge service just by having this podcast, just tying, you know, bringing these ends together, tie, making sure people find great resources, great educational opportunities. I think there's huge power in interdisciplinary teams and yeah. study clubs, because like you said, you can't do these cases as an island. No. You need a team. The team's getting bigger too. Yeah. Yeah. My, no kidding. You know, our team, we have ENTs, we have jaw surgeons, we have myofunctional therapists, allergists, um, OT, people that do the tongue tie release. So it's it's not it's not just uh the perio ortho restorative anymore. I it makes it more satisfying because you get to be involved with these teams and you can see how patients can be so positively affected. But dang, it's a lot of work, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. All right. I, I want to segue into being, being a mom and being a spouse and how, how does someone like Becca Balkow sort of manage running a practice, being on the cutting edge, being an educator, and then still figuring out how to, how to make it work for on the other, on the other front. Uh, I have a very supportive husband, a very, very, very supportive husband who who is willing to be home, willing with, with joy to be home with the kids when I'm on the road. And when I'm home and when, I ha when I'm with them, that's, that, that's it. The phones go away, computers go away. And I try to do what I can do at the office. And, and of course, like on Fridays, so that when I'm with them, it's 100% with them. I think that's always, uh, maybe not always, I think for most of us, it's, it's challenging because obviously you love what you do, right? And if there were no other obstacles, I, I mean, I could do this 100 hours a week uh, because I just love it so much, but that's not, that's not reality. That's not reality being a human and, and being in the real world and being able to set it to, to the side. I think that's a key, just being able to put it to, to the side and make sure that you're devoting as much time to those people that you love as much as you do to the profession that you love so much. Right. Well, and, and I have two little girls and, and I hope, I hope they will see that their mom works and, and I hope that inspires them to know that they can do anything they want to do, whatever, whatever place they find joy in, in their professional life one day. I think that's, I think that's super important. I think that's incredibly important. I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge woman advocate. I had a very strong mom, was a working mom and she sort of led the way and it's really influenced me and my daughter's an incredibly successful young woman in the, in the, uh, in the working career. And I'm incredibly blessed and grateful and proud of her. One of the things that I always um, admire with women dentists is how they manage their practices. Um, I'm a, I'm a horrible, I'm, I'm a horrible boss. Let me just say this right off the bat. I'm a horrible leader. I do my best, but I, it's not what I want to be doing. I want to be doing dentistry and it's and the leadership stuff has always been real challenging for me. And it's different, I think, as a male business owner than a female owner when you're, when it's mostly women that are working in the workplace. I think I get away with being able to say, not say, not in, like I can ask for things and because I'm male in this male dominated world and male dominated profession that I'm automatically things will likely get done. I wonder as a woman owner, and I know many women dentists that own their practices, I believe you guys have different challenges with that. Would you agree or no? I guess I don't, I don't know that I can compare because I don't know what your practice is like. I think um, ownership is hard. Mm -hmm. Leadership is hard. Uh, but maybe the challenges make it that much sweeter when, when we have our successes. Yeah. Oh, I, we have built a wonderful leadership team. I couldn't do this without, without my associate, Dr. Cassie Trong, who's phenomenal. And, and we have wonderful team leaders, office managers. Um, I couldn't do it without them, but we spend a lot of time on leadership. We spend a lot of time on collaboration, learning, 
uh, systems, accountability, and we're always growing. And we're, we're first to admit that we're not perfect and that we're always trying to be better. So creating systems in place and opportunities to stop and pause and, and ask, where, where are we? Are, are, do we like where we are? Where do we want to be? And are we, get, are we on the right path? What advice would you have for young dentists that are sort of trying to stay out of corporate dentistry and build their own practices? What, what advice would you have from, from building a practice, leadership stuff? Uh, I've, I've read a lot of books and, and, and I think just being very humble and, and always making sure that you stay true to your, to your core values. And I think just treat, treat leadership and treat practice ownership like you treat dental CE, constantly seek opportunities to learn, find mentors, find people that you can learn from to, to can just continue to grow and know that we're, we're always learning and always trying to do better. It's I not think, easy. It's not easy. And I, I think that's a great point is that um, it looks easy from the outside when you look at a successful practice it looks easy. But then as uh, my partner, uh, Chris Ching, I think he thought it looked easy from, from the outside. And now that he's running the practice, he understands the, the, you know, I don't want to say it's the daily grind, but it really is. It's the responsibility of, of running the team and having great stewardship. And I think that's, it's great. And it's a wonderful experience, but it's, it is, it's work for sure. And you have to dedicate that time to learning about yourself and your management style, your leadership style, beyond just learn, trying to learn the dentistry. And For I, sure. Rebecca, it's, uh, this has been awesome. Uh, you know, we're, we're blessed in dentistry. I think it's different than medicine in that I think that... I don't know, maybe we're more casual. I think it's, we get to go to meetings and I don't know, it's just different. And I feel so blessed to be in this profession. And I think being around people like yourself that are really trying to move us forward, it, it makes us all better. And I think collaborative dentistry, interdisciplinary dentistry, if you're not out there practicing that, if you are still just in your hole, just trying to do, you need direct, you need directional dentistry. You're trying to control everything. It's just so, so much more satisfying and you can do so much more things when you can work with a team to be getting more optimal results. Yeah. I think it's, it's rewarding. It's fulfilling. It's definitely more exciting. Yeah. And I think that's it, right? Cause if I sit around just doing, you know, you know, single unit crowns, posterior fillings, stuff like that every day. I, I, don't, I don't know that I would want to do that for 35 plus years, right? So I think this makes it so much more enjoyable. Any parting words, any, any thoughts for our, for our listeners before uh, we were say our adieu? I, yeah, I just think, thank you so much for this opportunity. And thank you to the listeners who are listening. And if anybody is, is just trying to think about where what to do with their career where to go just to keep asking great questions find mentors and uh, just don't don't think that the barriers that are in front of you are true barriers great now i know um for people who want to get uh to learn from rebecca you they can find you through the spear education so you're one of the uh, adjunct folk or faculty members of spear mm -hmm. uh i i saw that you're going to be at the um the aesthetic meeting in hawaii next yep. year. So I'll see you in August for that. Any other places they should know if they want to find you and learn more about an orthodontist who's understanding airway and how to expand and, and work with their orthodontist to be able to get better, uh, better treatment? Um, yeah, I think Spear Education. There, we've got some online modules. We have a seminar. And then Mike Gunson and I have a three-day course as well. We only do it once a year. The next one's in two or three weeks in Seattle. If, if anyone's interested, but it, but it covers this whole spectrum from early childhood all the way through to um, adulthood, wow. growth and development, expansion, gummy smiles, open, open bites, over bites, cross bites, the whole joints, sleep, speech. Wow. Um, and that that's uh, October 20 to 22nd this year, but um, that's, that's been a fun collabor collaboration that, that I've been a part of this year. All right. Well, listen, thank you so much. Uh, and 
for our dental online listeners. Thank you so much for listening in on our conversation. And until next time, yours for better dentistry. I'm Dr. Dennis Hartley. Well, thanks so much for listening or viewing our Sharecast today. If you enjoy this and you want to get more information from dental online training, then check us out at dothandson.com. That's one word, dothandson.com. Now, as a reminder, DOT has so many other great opportunities for your learning. We have our Wine and Unwind monthly webinars where we engage real time with our viewers as we bring in leaders throughout the dental industry to bring you up to date information and answer your questions. We have our monthly coffee and donut study club session where our participants bring in cases and we treat and plan these cases together to help you bring great treatment to your patients. We have our live virtual workshops where our dental online trainers perform the same techniques from their kits as I'm doing from the comfort of their own home or office. We have our blogs and we have endless selection of our hands-on pre-recorded technique courses to help you improve the clinical dentistry that you can provide for your patients. That's right. With our on-demand courses, you do these hands-on exercises when the time is right for you. So check us out on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn at Dental Online Training. And hey, be sure to share this with your friends and colleagues who you think might benefit from this ShareCast and everything that DOT has to offer. And now, how about one of those coveted five-star ratings? Please go to your site and help us by getting the word out to others. And we'd welcome one of those wonderful five-star ratings. This episode was created with special help from Claire O'Neill. It was edited by Ashley Dixon Ellison and with original music by Chris Peterson. Again, thank you for listening. I'm Dr. Dennis Hartley, yours for better dentistry.